the shame from my face and gave me grace so I could say, Ooh, Jesus, your love's incredible, incredible. You can make it so, so marvelous, marvelous. Jesus, your love's incredible, incredible. and it is, and it is.
Journey's Crossing. Hey, we're so glad you're here with us. Hey, why don't you go ahead and stand up? We're going to do some singing. We have the choir with us this morning. Woohoo! Woo <laughs> we have some fun. We we'll teach you some new songs. Um, go ahead and, and follow us. The, the lyrics will be on the screen. The song we want to teach you this morning is called My God. Come on, let's put those hands together now. So good. 
sing this next song. I want to be close to you.
seated. I hope that's your prayer this morning, is that we want to be closer and closer to our Father in heaven, to Jesus. He loves us so much. He loves each of you so much. And uh, he wants to be close to us, which is just a, a mind-boggling thing when I think about it. The creator of the universe, the king of kings, wants to know us and have a relationship with us. So much that he sent, you know the scripture, he sent his one and only son for us to die on the cross for our sins. And as we sing this next song, the servers are going to pass some trays of juice that reminds us of his blood that was poured out for us, some pieces of bread that reminds us of his body that was broken for us. Jesus said, whenever you come together, he said, do this to remember me, to remember my sacrifice and my love. So take one of each and hold on to that. We're going to continue to sing. Listen to the words of this song. We've sung it before. If you're not familiar with it, we invite you to, uh, to look the words and, and sing along with us as you, as you learn the, the chorus. And be reminded of the story of Jesus, of his love, and what he went through and what he did for us. Let's continue to sing. <laughs>
name is victory. All praise belongs to him. You hold in your hands this piece of bread reminding us of his body. Go ahead and take and eat this morning. And you hold in your hands this cup. Go ahead and drink the cup reminded of his blood poured out for you. you pray with me? Jesus, we come in this place, and we, we've been singing, we've been celebrating, and uh, we're reminded of your goodness. We're reminded how much you love us. And we come together as a family, as brothers and sisters in your name, and uh, we thank you that you not only died for us, but you rose again. You conquered sin and death, and it's for that reason that we, we shout, we sing, we, we dance, and we do crazy dance moves like myself, <laughs> try to dance, um, we give you our hearts, and uh, that's what it's about. We worship you with all of our hearts, and we give you praise this morning. In your name we pray, Jesus, amen. All right, good morning, Journey's Crossing. You guys sound great, and the choir was awesome, right? Give it up to them. I always love it when they lead us in worship and model for us what praise and worship should look like, and you guys were right there. We together were with this big choir, and that I, I know that all heaven tunes in to listen to our songs. Hey, our servers are going to come and collect those uh, plastic empty cups from you so you don't have to hold on to them. And, make all kinds of crunching sounds and forget about them and all that stuff. So just a little something we're doing for you. So you can put them in the baskets when they're passed. We are so glad you're with us, that you took time on a cold morning, which is supposed to get 50-something today. Yeah, I'm liking this winter, you? Yeah? And I like that we're together and we're learning and growing. And I hope you'll keep bringing friends and you'll keep being here. And if you're online, welcome. So good to see you and have you with us as well. We are in the last week of a series that we're calling, This Is What We Do. And we've been talking about a subject that's a little sensitive because it has to do with our generosity, our time, our talent, and even the hardest, probably, our resources, our treasure, our money. But today, Darren is going to kick it out of the park, hit a home run, to show us and illustrate when we are generous together, what can be done, the power of we. And that is so true. Many of us in this room think we don't have a whole lot, but the fact is when you and I work with others, we can make a profound difference in the world around us, and that's what we are all about. So I'm glad you're here. If you're visiting with us for the first time, I want to say welcome. If you're tuning in for the first time, welcome. If you're here in this room and uh, you want to find out more about Journey's Crossing, just stop by the Welcome Center on your way out of the exit later on. Tell them you're new here. They'll give you a gift. Answer any questions you have. We would just love to serve you and help you get connected in any way possible. We've been doing something that we started at the beginning of this series, and we're continuing as we move into the next series next week. We have an after party, which is Mondays. And we do a video podcast. And one of the features of that podcast is we answer questions that you might have that come to your mind during the service or before the podcast. And we would love to answer those, or at least attempt to answer those, because we don't have all the answers. But you can text uh, after party, two words, to 301-880-1543. That's on the screens. No question is too small. Um, there can be questions too big, but we'll try. We'll pull in somebody really smart if it's way beyond our capacity. Last week, we didn't have any questions, and I spoke, so I figured one of two things happened. Either I just completely answered every question you had, or I completely confused you. And I think it's probably the latter, all right? But Darren's got some great stuff we're going to look at together. So text those questions in. We'd love for you to be a part of it. Next week, we start a new series. And it's called Bystander. And we have eight weeks up until Easter. And seven weeks starting next week, we're going to go through the Gospel of John, which is an incredible story about a guy named John, a real 
live person, and what he witnessed following around a rabbi from the town of Nazareth, hitherto known as Jesus. We're going to look at the miracles in the book of John and how John used those to impact his faith. And I know they will impact yours if you'll be here and your friends if you'll bring them. So that starts next week, and I am really pumped. And that goes all the way through Easter. What a great topic as we get ready to the special time of year. So in just a moment, we're going to receive our offering, but I have uh, an announcement of sorts, and I'm going to use this jean jacket to help. Um, this morning when I got up, I got cleaned up, and I got ready to come here, and I grabbed the jean jacket out of the closet. The problem was it wasn't mine. And I don't think it's been my workout. We'll pump you up. Some of you remember that. That's an old SNL thing. And I'm like, okay, this, either I ate way too much yesterday, or I worked out too much, probably not, or somebody shrunk something. Then I realized it's my wife's jean jacket. I had a couple of solutions, though. One was I'll skip breakfast and hopefully fit into it. Not working. Um, I'll just try to stretch it, and then I'll have the anger of my wife. Not a good night. Best solution, get rid of it. Get a new jacket, right? Find my funny jacket that fits me so well. Ah, yes, indeed. That's much better, right? Okay. What's the point? We have a problem, and it's a good problem. This January, we grew over 15% over the last year, right? That's awesome. And if anything is like normal, we're going to keep growing, particularly up and past Easter. And we didn't realize how difficult it is at the end of first service to get cars out of the parking lot so new cars could come in for the second service. And some of you are like, duh, it's been a problem for a while, Mark. So we tried to fix it, okay, like putting on a wrong jacket. We thought, well, let's just kind of shorten the service a little bit. Maybe that'll work. Didn't work. Let's get people out there directing traffic. Good thing, safer thing, didn't fix it. Let's change the service times we did in January. Didn't fix it. We needed a new jacket. So here's the thing. We're going to have new service times to give us a little more breathing room in between. So particularly those of you that come second service, you'll have a parking spot. And our friends will have parking spots. I've heard people come to Journey's Crossing, and this is not a good story, and they see they can't find a parking spot, and they turn around and go home. Never want that to happen, right? So we have a new thing. We're calling it 15 on 15 for 15. We like the number 15. What it means is on March the 15th, we're going to go to 915 and 1115 so we can get ready for 15%. Now, hopefully, that's going to help us. I know it's not perfect, and I thank you so much for your patience as we try to figure this out. We might have to massage things around yet, but we're hoping that gives us enough time to do all the good stuff that happens in here, plus a little breather, and then some time for you to have a parking spot, okay? So that's what we're going to try. Be patient with us. I know we're changing some things, but it's because of good stuff. So we can all fit into our jackets somehow or something. So thank you for your patience. And I know it's, it's some stuff that's going different, but I know you guys are big people that can handle it, right? I know you are. So we want to get ready for a time of offering, and I want to introduce a friend of mine, a person, Todd Tasky, where are you? Come on up here, buddy. Um, Todd has been a good friend and a part of Journey's Crossing. Yeah. He's a handsome guy. He's, he wouldn't fit in. Well, he might fit into Barb's jacket and then flex once and break it in pieces, so I won't give it to him. But Todd has been a part of JC since we were at the movie theaters in Gaithersburg at the Rio, so this is a long time. And he was even baptized here, I don't know, 10, 11 years ago, something like that. And one of the things that he has taught me is about generosity, because he definitely is a generous person, 
and he's modeled that. And he shared some things with me, and I said, you know, why don't you share that with the rest of us? So as you get ready for our offering, in just a few minutes, Todd's going to share, and uh, then he'll pray, and we'll move on. morning. So I um, want to talk about two things that I know pretty well, and that's uh, football and money. And uh, I want to talk about not what they are, because I think you know what they are, but, but I think what they represent and what they represent for most people in one fashion or another is really the truth. And we don't get the truth a lot in life, but money and football brings that out. And First, I'll talk about football because I used to coach eighth grade boys football. And an eighth grade boy is trying to figure out a lot and um, trying to figure out if you're, you know, if you're cool or you're not or you're fast or you're strong or you're popular or whatever it is. And, and kids don't get truth at home. What they get at home, hopefully, is they get love. So they show up first day of football and they think they're fast and they think they're strong and everybody wants to be quarterback, right? And you can't, you can't win at football with that. The great thing about football, though, is that the truth will hit you right in the face right away. So mom and dad tell you that you're strong, well, you're going to find out right now. You're going to find out against that kid. And if you're not fast enough or strong enough, the great thing about football is there's still a place for you, right? If God didn't make you six something and 200 pounds, you can learn technique. You can develop quick feet. You can be good at the game of football. You'll find a coach who will teach you how to get to the quarterback. You can be good at football, and you're needed in that game. And that's one of the things I always loved about coaching football is because it is the truth, and then you've got to learn to deal with that. And then I think as we grow up, money's exactly that. I spent my first 20 years as a financial planner, and I spend a lot of time thinking about money and talking to people about money. And if I were to see your checkbook or your Venmo account, I would know an awful lot about you. I'd know a lot more about you than the things that you tell me. Because truth is in your money. It represents and reflects the things that are most important to you. And and that's, I think, for most of us, a real opportunity because that defines who it is that we are. And we can make decisions about who it is that we are really every week. And the church taught me, thanks to Mark and... Bill and Darren, that there's a concept of tithing, which means you give your 10% to the church. And it took me a while to get there. It took me a long while to get there. But what I've learned from that, we all know that we want to be in a relationship with Jesus where we trust in Jesus, right? Well, what I learned through tithing is that I feel like I'm now in a relationship with Jesus where he can trust me. And that's that's an incredible feeling. You know, I've had, there's a great story in the Bible. I don't know if anyone knows this guy, Aeneas, Ananias. So the quick story is that, you know, Saul's going to Damascus, and Saul's on the hunt for Christians. He's on the hunt for Christians because he's going to kill them. So if you know the story, Jesus knocks him off the horse, he blinds him, and then he shows up to Aeneas and says, I need you to go to Saul and tell him something. Right? That's a pretty big bite. And he said, I'm not qualified for that, and goes on and on. But the Lord used him to do one thing for him that he needed because he trusted him. And I've seen it in much smaller ways in my life. But I got to go with Darren one time on the other side of the world to the Philippines to deliver a $20 T-shirt to a kid at the end of nowhere for a reason I don't understand, but I know that it's the role that the Lord asked me to play. And so that has become really important for me. It's the, the, it's the selfish side, if you will, of, of tithing or giving. Because as you all know, because you all do it, when you give, it, it, it's something we do because of how it makes us feel. When we give, it, it, it's a reflection of who we truly are. And I think we carry around all this worry with us that the Lord doesn't want us to have about the, the fact that we don't have enough or we're not enough or whatever it is. And this is our chance to do it, and this is our place where we can do that. So this is our challenge, right? You see this in the book, in, in the program that we get every week. If you pay attention to where we are financially, we're short every week. There's no excuse for it. We're one of the wealthiest communities in America. If everybody, if everybody in this church gave 10%, 
we would have three or four times what our budget is. So we're just not there. We're just not doing it. So my challenge to you is this. Let's do this much more. Everybody in the room, let's do 10% more. And let's just do that for the next five weeks. That takes us to the end of March. Right? So for the next five weeks, do 10% more. And what you realize is it doesn't make any difference in your life from a financial standpoint. I think emotionally it'll make a really big difference in your life. And I know it'll make a big difference in the life of the church because there's a lot of things that this church can do, is doing, and wants to do. So that's my challenge. That's my couple thoughts on football and money. And I'll wrap it up with a couple words, and then we'll do the offering. Dear Lord, thank you for the great gift that we have in Journeys Crossing. We're all doing the best that we can. We know that there's more inside us. We know that there's more that we can do. We know that we're in a good place to do that. We thank you. We ask you for your continued strength, guidance, wisdom, and courage. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Thank you. While we receive the offering, here's some coming announcements that will be on the screen. Hi there. Welcome to Journey's Crossing. I'm glad you're here. My name is Golda. And I'm excited to share a few things coming up in the next couple of weeks. You can use your connection card, the JC app, or text the keyword from your phone to sign up or get more information for anything I mention. I hope you'll jump in and take a step forward on your journey. At JC, we believe that everyone is unique and that following Jesus is not just a classroom experience, but a journey. If you're wondering what your next step is here at the church, look no further. We offer a fun four-week interactive experience called Next, where we'll help you discover and take your next step here at the church. We offer the experience every Sunday during the 11.30 service in room 105. We'll give you a backpack, lots of coffee, and a brand new piece of equipment each week to reinforce the training we're giving you to follow Jesus with us. Do you ever feel like every day is the same as yesterday and no one really gets you? Why not change that? A small group at Journey's Crossing will make a difference in how you see yourself and your purpose in life. Small groups only last 8 to 12 weeks and are starting now. Some are already filled. This opportunity only happens three times a year, so don't miss your chance. Check out the small group brochure at the Welcome Center, pick a group that sounds best, and sign up today. One step does it all. It's really that easy. Text the word GROUPS to 301-880-1543 and click your group choice, or check out our group on the program insert and drop it in the blue box or your collection bag today. Whatever you do, don't miss this. Let this be your next step that helps you toward your best you in five years. Three times a year, our church dedicates a Saturday for community outreach called Serve Saturday. On March 28th, you can join one of seven opportunities to join teams and share God's love doing things like packing breakfast bags for the homeless, getting a baseball field ready for opening day, participating in a Zumba class with the elderly, or even donating blood at our youth-sponsored American Red Cross Blood Drive. To see our list of projects and to sign up, go to journeyscrossing.org events and look for our Serve Saturday banner. Projects are filling up fast. Well, that's about it for this week. As always, there's a lot of great stuff happening in between Sundays at Journey's Crossing. Don't forget to check your program or our app for more details and get plugged in today. All right, how's everyone doing today? Good, man. I, I kind of like this uh, this series title that we landed on. I know it's it's been a quick series, a three week series goes by really fast, but 
A few weeks ago, uh, Bill and Mark and I were deciding what to call this series on generosity. I'm glad we landed on this is what we do. I like it because it's strong. Uh, and, and For me, it's encouraging. Uh, it's got some oomph for some grit to it. It's challenging me. And I'm one of those people that don't get offended when someone's trying to challenge me towards areas I need to grow in, like generosity. I'm like, yeah, let's, let's go for it. Let's do it. And so I'm glad we picked it. I like it for lots of reasons. I like the, the black and white of branding. It's like, just do it, kind of like Nike, kind of. Like, I like that. And uh, uh, it just reminds us of, uh, I don't know, I, I've, I've heard this phrase before somewhere, and I think maybe it's because I watch too much sports, but uh, you know how in, uh, in the, during the football season, they'll mic up like the quarterback or one of the defensive linemen, and uh, they're all in this big like kind of huddle, and the, there's way too much testosterone going, but they're all bouncing kind of around, and this is what we do, the quarterback will say, or something, this is what we do. And it's kind of like it's kind of everyone's kind of rallies around that. Or maybe uh, maybe I heard it at a uh, in a locker room after a basketball game where uh, you know the team came back from like 15 points behind, and the reporter for ESPN is saying, "Wow, you guys came back from 20 points, 15 points down. Tell us about that." And the guy says, "You know, sweat pouring down. This is this is what we do, right? Okay. So I I love the sports uh, kind of feel to that, and I know I've heard that phrase uh, from some athlete uh, before. I was fortunate to play." Uh, uh, when I was younger, playing on some really good sports teams uh, in Little League, uh, we were one of the best uh, teams in the state of Missouri when I was in Little League. And uh, we had people banging on the trash cans to let us know what pitch was coming. It was awesome, I'm telling you. Okay. And I was on a really good junior varsity basketball team over two years. I uh, only lost one game, which was cool. And I was also part of a cross-country running team uh, every year. Uh, when I was in high school, we won conference in uh, cross country. But, but you don't have to be in sports or even like sports to get this concept of what happens when people work together to accomplish something. Some of you maybe were in theater when you were in high school, and you work for months and months, and then opening night comes, and you're just like, wow, that was awesome. All that hard work paid off as you work together. Or maybe some of you were in band, and you play, and you play, and you practice, and practice, and you're not sure if it's going to come together, and it ends up coming together. It's really, really good. Some of you know what this dynamic's like in your workplace. Maybe you worked on a government contract for months and months and months, and then you got it. And you're like, man, it's great to work together with other people who add something different to the thing. Some of you, maybe, uh, maybe moms, you work together to solve some kind of community problem or some kind of issue, or you threw a party for someone, and you all work together. What I'm trying to say is I think we all have experiences where we've worked with other people, and, and everybody's contribution came in, and it worked out. Uh, so my favorite word in today's title, which we're calling the power of we, is this is what we do. That's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, communal generosity, when people come together to contribute stuff, is an ancient practice. It's all over the pages of the Bible. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to look at some of the Bible's best this is what we do moments as it relates to generosity. And I'm going to give you five examples, and they're going to yield what I'm calling a short list of what happens when we become more generous, when we become more generous. So if you like to take notes, uh, you can do so in your program. But here's the first one. When we become more generous, we create unique environments where people find and follow Jesus. Now, for this one, we're going to go all the way back to the Old Testament, to the time where uh, Moses has uh, delivered the people from uh, Egyptian slavery. They've crossed over the, uh, uh, the Red Sea. They've received the Ten Commandments, and now they're kind of languishing a little bit in this wilderness or the desert of Sinai. And God says, you know, I, I want my people to be close to me. I want people to know that I'm close to them. And so he, he commands uh, Moses to build this big thing. It's called the sanctuary or a tabernacle, okay? Are you familiar with this? we got a picture of it, I think. It's this huge kind of, it's, it's a very unique kind of thing. Uh, it was 150 feet long, which is about half the size of a football field, 75 feet wide. And uh, there were four layers. It's not depicted in this picture. It was four layers of curtains, okay? So it's that thick. And then inside, there were all these places where you could offer sacrifices, and there were these places where you could uh, worship and pray. And then that other room is called the Holy of Holies, and only the priest could go in there once a year. And that's where the Ark of the Covenant is. Remember uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark? They had this big box that had all the spiritual artifacts in it. And so... Basically what it was, though, it was a central hub where people gathered. And more importantly, it was a focal point for spiritual life. People would go there to pray and offer sacrifices and hear the law of Moses and the scriptures. It was a unique structure where people could feel close to God. But before it ever got built, they took up this huge offering for it. 
And that's where we pick up the story in Exodus 35, verses 4 to 8. Then Moses said to the whole community of Israel, probably 2 to 3 million people, this is what the Lord has commanded. Take a sacred offering for the Lord. Let those with generous hearts present the following gifts to the Lord. Here's what we need. Gold, silver, bronze, blue, purple, and scarlet thread, fine linen and goat hair for cloth, tanned ram skins and fine goat skin leather, acacia wood, olive oil for the lamp, spices for the anointing oil, fragrant incense, and you get the idea. There's even more and more things that he, that he tells them to bring. So now we go down to verse 20. So the whole community of Israel left Moses and returned to their tents. All whose hearts were stirred and whose spirits were moved came and brought their sacred offerings to the Lord. They brought all the materials needed for the tabernacle, for the uh, performance of its rituals, and for the sacred garments. That's the things the priest would wear. So how do you think this turned out? Well, we go down to Exodus chapter 36, and here's what happened. So they went to Moses. These are the guys that put the, uh, uh, the sanctuary together and reported. The people have given more than enough materials to complete the job the Lord has commanded us to do. So Moses gave the command, and this message was sent throughout the camp. Men and women, don't prepare any more gifts for the sanctuary. We have enough. And so the people stopped bringing their sacred offerings. Their contributions were more than enough to complete the whole project. And this is probably the only time, and this was the first and the only time in church History where anyone told church people, stop bringing money. We got enough. We're good. We're just quit it. We're, we've got enough. I mean, can you imagine that happened at Journey's Crossing? You come in here on Sunday, and the person who's the MC says, you know what? Uh, keep your bill phone your, uh, in your uh, pocket today. We're good. We don't, we don't need anything. Can, can you imagine that happening at Journey's Crossing? Nope, neither can I, okay? But it did. It, hap- it happened back to this time. So now I want to say a couple of things about this tabernacle thing. This building that we're in right now is, is, is not the tabernacle, and it's not the temple uh, which Solomon built later. And biblically speaking, this place we're in right now is not even officially the house of God. Now, I know when you were little, you were running around, and, and mom or someone said, stop running in the house of God, okay? That's well-intentioned, but it's really not biblically accurate. We're sitting in a renovated office space, quite frankly, okay? The floor looks like Urban Outfitter, okay, if you've ever been in there, Okay. And so it's not really the house of God, but it is, it is a unique environment where people are finding and following Jesus. And like the tabernacle, all of us, we come into this place and we sing and we pray and we hear from God. And this place came about as a result of shared generosity. You know, three or four years ago, we had this campaign, somebody there, Beyond Belief, right? Now, we came up quite a bit under what people pledged, but God got us in here, Right? And that's, and that's where we're at. And, and, and God is doing great stuff in this building, amazing stuff. And not just on Sundays, and not just in this room. Our generosity is spilled out into other unique places that came about as a result of generosity. So, for example, uh, I guess in combination, there are like 100 people who watch the services online. I never know where the camera is, but hello. Uh, glad you're with us today, right? That's a very unique structure as well. It's a unique environment where people are finding and following Jesus. Last weekend, 50 or so of our high school and middle school students were at a conference in Pennsylvania, uh, a Christian conference. And they were in like a conference room or a ballroom, and they were learning to find and follow Jesus. And during the week, we have people meeting in people's homes and, and having small groups. There's even a small group at Wegmans in the food court, if you can believe that. All right? So these are all unique kind of places where God, through generosity, is helping people find and follow Jesus. Now, there's a couple other things I want to note here uh, in terms of application, uh, the tabernacle construction. Did you notice the list of all the things, kind of weird to us, but the list of all the things people brought, okay? So in my mind's eye, I imagine, okay, everyone's bringing their offering. And here's this guy, and he's got like a a box of gold. And he's standing next to a lady who's got a sack of goat hair. (laughs) And you're like, okay. But, But together, they're kind of going up to give their offering. There's another lady, and maybe she's got an armful of silver, and she's trying to hold it, and then she goes up to the place to give the offering. And standing next to her is a teenage boy, and he's got some kind of container, like it's got oil in it, right? And so the, together, all these people, no matter what they had, they brought it up to the thing, and then, in, in my imagination, they fist pump, and they say, this is what we do. This is what we do, right? It's a very cool thing. In fact, I wrote down in my notes uh, something I want to put up on the screen. It wasn't so much about what they brought, but that they all brought something. Right? 
So I have a friend who is a, um, the pastor at a church outside of Philadelphia. His name is Brian Jones. And his church met in movie theaters for years. And then finally they had a, what's called a capital campaign where they asked people to make pledges and bring money so they could get into a new building. And the, the pledges were great. And so they had this celebration banquet afterwards. Kind of, we did it kind of thing. And uh, when Brian was there, he said he noticed a couple guys. They were homeless looking. And he's kind of thinking, I'm probably sure they didn't pledge anything. They're probably just here for the free food. You know, and so Brian's heart was kind of hard against, you know, what he saw there. He was like, brother, you know. But as they celebrated, as the uh, MC said, you know, announced the number, and they said, we did, these guys were jumping up and down. They said, we did it, we did it. And then God softened Brian's heart and caused him to remember that, yes, together, this is what we do. It's the power of we playing out in generosity. Now, not too many months from now, uh, we want to. It sounds like we want to take over the rest of this building. When you came in, you probably saw this Comstar kind of thing. What is that? Okay, they're renting from us. And so what we'd like to do a few months from now is challenge all of us to blow this wall out and to be able to go over to Comstar and say, you know, it's been a great relationship, but we're, we're, we're about to terminate this relationship, right? It's not, it's not you, it's us. But uh, we, want to, we, want to get, we want to get over there, okay? And what that will do is that will allow for more space for this It'll allow a place for our youth group to go. It'll allow for some meeting rooms for people to come up during the week so that we can find and follow Jesus. All right? So here's the second thing. When we become generous together, we participate in a community and a continuum of changed lives. There are some hard to spell words there. We participate in a community and a continuum of changed lives. What happens is our generosity places us in the company of other people whose lives have been changed. And this is very cool. What it also means is that there are people in the future who we haven't met yet, and our stories are going to kind of intersect with theirs so that even more people in the future can find and follow Jesus. Now, a few weeks ago, I was uh, reading the Bible, and I may have told you that I'm trying to read slower this time. I'm not trying to like see how much I can like check off. And so I came upon this passage in Luke 8, which really, I think, uh, illustrates what I'm talking about here, this idea of community and continuum. Luke 8, 1 to 3. Soon afterward, Jesus began a tour of the nearby towns and villages, preaching and announcing the good news of the kingdom of God. And he took his 12 disciples with him, along with some women who had been cured from evil spirits and diseases. Among them were Mary Magdalene, from whom he'd cast out seven demons, Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's business manager, Susanna, and many others who were contributing from their own resources to support Jesus and his disciples. Now, now if you're just reading the Bible quickly, this, this looks like filler material, right? This is like a footnote. It's like, okay, get me to the good stuff. It's like you're already plowing through this stuff. But if you're reading slowly, like there's some really significant stuff here, all right? So first of all, it's interesting that Luke adds to the, uh, the mixture that there were women, in addition to the 12 men, apostles, that there were women following Jesus. And this is significant because women in Bible culture were kind of like social outcasts. And Luke's gospel, more than the other three, highlights social midfits and social outcasts in his gospel. Matthew highlights Jewish people. That's his audience. Mark has a Greek audience. That's why his gospel is short and full of miracles. John's trying to reach skeptics, people who don't believe. But Luke's gospel is like, this Jesus guy, he's for everyone. He's for women. He's for the poor. He's for the people who have diseases and all kinds of illness. So notice that, women following Jesus. And not just women. They get their names written on the pages of Scripture. He names who they are. This is huge. This is significant. And then he adds the fact that these women who were following Jesus, some of them had diseases, likely incurable diseases like leprosy, and one woman had seven demons inside of her. Can you imagine the horror of that? And yet these women came to know Jesus. They began following Jesus, and their lives were flipped and changed. Isn't that cool? And now they're following Jesus, and they're contributing financially to his ministry. And they're not just giving money that their husbands have made. These gals apparently have jobs of their own. And from their own means, from their own resources, they're committing to the ministry of Jesus Christ. And if you got lost in the tangle of all that, let me just give it to you in four words. Here it is. Changed people change people, right? 
And that's the beauty of generosity and this, this community of changed lives we're talking about. I've been doing church work my whole adult life, and let me tell you what I've seen. There is a direct connection between a church's generosity and a church's growth. It's just that. They're like hand in glove. The giving of our resources for Christ's kingdom results in stories of life change. Listen, upstream, upstream from every person who's given their life to Jesus, you'll find generosity. Now, last week was kind of weird. Uh, so it was Baptism Sunday, but we were also talking about financial giving. And so Mark's up here preaching his guts out about, uh, you know, let's tithe, let's, let's increase our giving. And I'm standing over here waiting to baptize people. And I'm thinking, one of these things is not like the other, you know? It's just like, well, how are we going to make this switch from Mark talking about giving to now baptizing people? You know, I was afraid some of you were going to get spiritual whiplash, you know, like, what, what's going on here? But then uh, God kind of like knocked on my head a little bit. He said, hey, this is a perfect time to be baptizing people and talking about generosity. These two things go together perfectly. So think about it. Last week, we took up an offering, we talked about giving, and we baptized eight people. It's seamless. It's perfect. It's what God has always had in mind for his church. We had eight baptisms. This is what we do. And by the way, there's 800,000 more people in this county we'd like to reach before we're done, okay? So a little bit of a challenge there, all right? It's all right. It's all... <laughs> all right. Here's the third thing. Again, we're talking about what happens when we all get more generous together, okay? We've said, number one, that we create these amazing, unique uh, places where people can come and follow Jesus. We say we get ourselves in a community and a continuum of life change. Here's number three. We meet each other's needs like a loving and caring family. I love this one. Do you know the most common term given to followers of Jesus in the New Testament is? It's not the church or saints or even Christians. The most common term used to describe the people who were following Jesus in the New Testament is family. Family. Isn't that cool? And I'm not advocating to go around calling each other Brother Bill or Sister Susie or all that because that's kind of weird, okay? But I will advocate, as the Scripture does, that we begin to treat and care for one another like a family. And I'm talking about normal and healthy families here, not some of the ones that you were maybe part of. And I know when I say the word family, some people are like, oh, no, you know. I heard a comedian say, you can't spell, uh, you can't spell families without lies. Okay, I don't know if that's true or not. But anyway, some of you have some baggage there, okay? So when I talk about family, I'm talking about good, healthy family when I talk about this. So, for example, I mean, if your sister called you and said, oh, I'm sick, and I need someone to come and care for the kids, and... And by the way, can you go to uh, the store and get all the things that people get when they're sick, you know, like Gatorade and crackers and bananas or that whole thing, okay? I mean, you would do that, right? Uh, if your brother texted you and said, man, I got laid off today. I don't know how I'm going to how I'm gonna make my mortgage payment, my car payment. I don't know how I'm going to do that. He'd probably respond to that, right? Or if your mom or dad needed some kind of financial help or, or your adult children, this one gets harder. But you, you would rise to that occasion, right? You wouldn't say, you wouldn't say, well, that, let me see what I have at the end of the month. So if I have anything left, I'll maybe try to help a little bit. Nor would you send them a card and put a $5 bill in it, right? You would help in a significant way. And that's what I'm advocating here. This is what the early church looked like. Now, we've already looked at generosity in the Old Testament, that whole sanctuary thing. We looked at it in the life of Jesus, women following him and supporting him. I want to show you what it looks like in the early church now. This is Acts 4, verse 32 through 35. Acts chapter 4, verses 32 to 35. All the believers were united in heart and mind. I love this next line. And they felt that what they owned was not their own. I love the way it says that. So they shared everything they had. The, the apostles testified powerfully to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's great blessings was upon them all. There was no needy people among them because those who owned land or houses would sell them and bring the money to the apostles to give to those in need. Now, the book of Acts is a history of the early church. It's not a blueprint for the church. We can't do everything exactly like they did. We just can't. Our culture is different. But we need to think about what would, what would generosity to our church family look like in our church culture, in our current culture? How can we love and care and meet the needs of our church family better? Now, you might notice in your program, we have this thing called community care needs. Have you ever seen this? Does anyone read the program? All right. So if you do, you'll see like, like two or three cases where we're trying to help people. Way back when Journey's Crossing started, we thought, what are we going to do when people come to us that have physical needs, but the offering isn't enough to supply that? So what we came up with, we said, well, let's ask 
Let's put it in the needs in the program, and let's ask and see if someone else, you know, uh, kind of gathers around that need. And the great story is there have been so many occasions where these needs have been met. I mean, I get goosebumps thinking about people who've gotten cars and their mortgage paid. And maybe they were out sick for several months, and we helped them with that, okay? There's lots and lots of those kind of stories. But think about this for a second. If all of us would become more generous together, I don't know if any of us would sell an entire home and bring the offering, but, but if we became more generous, we would maybe not need to put those needs in the program. We would have this reservoir of funds available so that when people in our church family needed help, we would just say, we would just dispense it. Here you go. And then that reservoir would fill right back up. Think about the possibility of that. And there would be so many. I mean, can you imagine the stories of God's provision that we could tell? And I tell you the truth. um, The community could not flock into here fast enough when those stories get told. Here's the fourth thing. We unite on the importance and the priority of helping the poor. Now, the last point I'm talking about how we take care of family. This point I'm I'm, I'm spreading it out and talking about how we would care for our community, right? We live in such divisive times, do we not? I mean, even though Gaithersburg and Germantown are number two and number three in uh, diversity, uh, we still have our share of problems getting along, don't we? I love Black History Month. My wife and I last night watched Harriet. Great movie. You should see it. And Black History Month highlights the men and the faithful men and women who have tried to get equality and justice and people to love one another. And we've covered great ground but we still got a long way to go, do we not? We are separated by race and religion and age and gender and especially politics, right? And the media and especially social media fuel the fires that divide us. And at times it feels like there are fewer and fewer things that really unite us, but let me give you two. The teaching slash life of Jesus Christ is one. And a shared concern for the poor among us is a second one. Did you know in the Bible there are over 2,000 verses which show us God's heart for the poor? Certainly we could unite around that, could we not? In the early days of Christianity, Peter and Paul kind of are the main characters in the story, right? And Peter and the other 11 apostles were primarily focusing to reach Jewish people, trying to convert Jewish people to Christianity. Meanwhile, this guy by the name of Apostle Paul said, well, I'll go to the Gentiles, and I'll preach to them. Now, as you can imagine, bringing these two cultures together, Jew and Gentile, which had been divided by hundreds of years, bringing those two together, even under Jesus, was not an easy task. And there were even awkward moments between Peter and Paul about certain uh, traditions and stuff like that. Ultimately, they worked it out because they loved Jesus, they loved lost people, and they cared about the poor. Check out this verse in Galatians 2, verses 9 and 10. This is Paul writing to uh, some of his church friends. He says, In fact, James, Peter, and John, who were known as the pillars of the church, recognized the gift God had given me, and they accepted Barnabas and me as their co-workers. They encouraged us to keep preaching to the Gentiles while they continued their work with the Jews. Their only suggestion was that we keep on helping the poor. Another version says, Remembering the poor which I was always eager to do. You see how, see how that brought the early church together? Jesus and generosity. Here's the last thing. One last thing. This is what generosity does for all of us. We partner with others sharing God's love all over the world. One of the proudest moments I've had as a pastor at Journey's Crossing was back in December when several of us sat in this room, and after hearing Mark speak and after Scott was singing, Several of you got up out of your chairs and you went to these side walls and we had these kids from Columbia, their profiles, hanging on these clotheslines. And you guys went over and grabbed one and said, for $38 a month, I'm going to make a difference in the world for a kid who's struggling through poverty. Well done. This is what we do. This is what we do. And that was, I, was, I was so proud of that. I still get emotional thinking about it. Almost 120 of you did that. But I want to show you, for the rest of you maybe couldn't do that, I want to show you our global partners And I want to begin this with an apology and by saying I have not done, as your outreach pastor, I have not done a good job telling you who these people are or introducing these people to you. So I'm trying to make up for some lost time. But Ralph and Charlotte Stice, you support them in Tunisia. If you want to take a picture of this and pray for these people, that would be awesome. Mahari and Paige Stafford in Ethiopia, Billy and Betty Loft in Latin America, Elise West in the Ukraine, Yala, I'm not even going to try that, last name in Thailand, and then Pastor Mong in the Philippines. 
And hardly a month goes by when I don't hear an update from these people. My heart just aches because I want us to do more for them. I want us to be more generous. And hardly a month goes by where there's not another missionary from another place that wants to get on this list. And I want to be able to say yes, but I haven't been able to say no to people. This is what we do in other countries. There are so many people in other countries who, unlike us, do not have a church on every street and do not have access to the gospel, the good news of Jesus. And so when we become more generous, we we share those opportunities around the world. Now, earlier I mentioned to you how Paul uh, was preaching to the Gentiles. So he became uh, basically the first Christian missionary, someone who would take the gospel to a cross-cultural context. And he writes this this, this word of thank you to uh, some of his friends in the church of Philippi, Philippians 4, 14 to 17. Even so, you've done well to share with me in my present difficulty, he writes. As you know, Philippians, you Philippians were the only ones who gave me financial help when I first brought you the good news and then traveled on from Macedonia. No other church did this. Even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent help once more. And I don't say this because I want a gift from you, not guilting you. Rather, I want you to receive reward uh, for your kindness. I have one last story I want to share with you to wrap up today. Uh, Bob Russell, who's now a retired uh, pastor, was the founding pastor of Southeast Christian Church in Louisville, Kentucky, one of the first mega churches in this country. Thousands and thousands of people still go there on Sunday mornings. And Bob Russell shared the story of one of, his, uh, one of the ladies in his church was a Sunday school teacher. And she was teaching that day, and she said, as, well, before the class uh, started, all the kids were coming in. And one of the kids came in, and he had, uh, I don't know if you've seen this before, but he had like a misshapen hand. Have you ever seen someone that, whose hand wasn't like fully developed, kind of looks maybe something like that? And so she says, I want him, she's talking to herself, she wants to make a conscious effort not to do anything that would highlight this kid's uh, challenge or to have anybody else notice it either. So she went through the lesson. She was doing well. And then she got to the end, and at the end of the Sunday school class, the kids always did the same thing, this little hand thing that they did. Maybe you're familiar with this. Uh, this is the church. This is the steeple. Open the door, and there's all the people. And then she forgot that this kid was in there, wouldn't be able to do it. But she looked over to her right, and one of the other young boys had come over with one of his hands and put it in the kid's good hand. And Bob Russell said, to them what I will say to you. Let's build the church together. Are you with that? Are you with that? Because this is what we do. This is what we do. All right, guys. So today's challenge, this week's challenge, today I'm committing along with others in my church family to grow in generosity. I don't know what that looks like for you. I know it's kind of a general thing, but whatever you need to do, if you want to take that challenge today, mark that on your connection card. We're going to take them up in just a few seconds from now, so work quickly. Some of you maybe aren't in this community of changed lives yet. You haven't given yourself to Christ yet. You haven't been baptized. I want to encourage you. We... We love you. We need you. We're waiting for you to join us. And so maybe that's a decision you need to make as well. Whatever your decision, use your connection card to do that. I'm going to pray. And then the choir is joining me. will sing us out of here, okay? Thank you, guys. Lord, we love you. We thank you for all that you're doing in our lives in this church. Uh, it's amazing, God. It's amazing what you do when several of us come together and our hearts are drawn to your kingdom and our hearts are drawn to your son, Jesus. And together we're asking questions like, what can we do? How can we help? Can I give my time? Can I give my talents? Can I give my treasure? It's an amazing dynamic that happens, Lord. And it started way back uh, when your son Jesus Christ came and said, I will build my church. So thank you, God, for letting us be a part of it and to be uh, people who are continuing it uh, for this generation of people. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't you go ahead and stand up? Together, we talked to this song earlier this morning. This is called My God. Come on, let's put those hands together. Here we go. Give me that joy. Joy like a river.
with us today. Come back and join us next week. Bring someone next with you as we start a new series called Bystander. God bless you. Have a great day. Have a great week.